background of what had happened in the Bunbury side of things, uh, generated by not only people in Bunbury, but people out in the southwest, and the way that we have made some progress um, over the years, and um, these many diverse groups and people have done uh, things in their different ways. They go about their business, um, and they have very diverse views about how they do that. Some quiet achievements, other more rah, 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 let's go and uh, sort them out. So, so, I guess our role is to be one seen, to be heard, but at the same time to educate, provide information and resources to people so that uh, we can get those people who are perhaps not so aware of what's going on around the place, um, in, I suppose, aware, enhanced, um, and lobbying and preparing uh, for what we need to do. The recent state elections provided a threat to democracy, but they also provided a big opportunity. Uh, with a government, that has power in both the upper house and the lower house. If somebody in this group, whatever the group is, can get to any of those people and get them um, uh, embraced in the, in the idea of making change, then uh, it'll go through. It won't have to be argued. They can just say, yeah, that sounds like a good idea, we're going to do it. Gordon raised two areas of particular concern, the drafting and implementation of the forest management plan, uh, by 2024, we absolutely must be involved in that. And not peripherally, but uh, importantly as a key area in that is uh, it's a forest conservation plan, not a management plan. And uh, we also need to sort out the prescribed burning issue after what happened in Pera. Uh, and we also need to uh, overhaul Alcoa's State Agreement Act um, for ripping out Jarrah Forest uh, to get uh, bauxite. Uh, it's not sustainable, we know that. Well, I'm... I suppose reasonably new to being active in Bunbury. I've only been back here a few years. I'm a retired teacher. I'm a mother of two and a grandmother of three. And so that was one of the motivations for me joining the Nanas for Native Forests. So who are the Nanas? We, well, it started in Margaret River, where a group of older women decided that they really needed to do something about the logging that was going on between Margaret River and Nana. So we are mothers, grandmothers, great-grandmothers from all walks of life and all political persuasions who share a deep concern for the well-being of coming generations and the forests that keep us alive. Um, we speak common sense backed by scientists and academics and we want the WA government to immediately protect all our native forests from logging and clearing for climate and biodiversity and to transition to transition away from logging native forests to plantation and farm forestry. And we know that protecting the forest ecosystems is only the start of what must happen to keep our earth habitable. So the sort of, um, so the Nana's group in Margaret River grew so quick, uh, so large that they couldn't really manage it. I think they ended up with close to 400 people on their books. So they have now decentralised and I have been a made the Grand Nana of Bunbury. And we have about 20 people on our mailing list. So, and, you know, we're more than interested in as many as more. You don't have to actually be a grandmother. You don't even have to be a woman. <laughs> we're, we're quite um, open to anyone who's interested to join with us to protect the forests. Um, what do we do? Well, we write letters. Um, we get in touch with, we just had a letter writing session here yesterday. We get in touch with as many politicians. We've just recently decided that we'll invite Amber J. Sanderson, our new Environment, Climate Action and Commerce Minister, <laughs> um, to come and have morning tea with us. So we're, you know, we're not sure whether that will be successful, but we'd like to have a chance to have a chat to her. Um, we try to spread information and about what is going on with native forests. A regular thing that we've just started doing is a sit and stitch. Um, this is our emblem. And so we sit, the, sit at cafes and stitch these and hopefully attract a bit of interest and have pamphlets ready to hand out and so on. So, and we do work closely with the West Australian Forest Alliance. I do believe that civil disobedience is a valid form of action. Um, I've recently had the um, privilege of meeting Bob Brown, and he pointed out that to save the Franklin River, they actually had over 1,500 people arrested. Um, and that's maybe the you know, extent you've got to go to to make things happen. But I also see that the Greens Party has a, has a role. We need, we need 
a political arm as well. So I just I, I think we do need to unite. I really look forward to the to the um, possibility of us having some sort of uh, overarching organisation. I'd just like to finish with a quote from Bob Brown. I'm a bit of a fan at the moment. Um, he says, there is a fundamental obligation on each generation to pass on to its descendants a world that is at least as rich and diverse and as capable of supporting its human population and the other beings which live on it as the world that we inherited from our ancestors. Thanks, Wendy. I guess we're certainly looking for those commonalities between the various groups. Um, I went on a two-day two -day tour with Wafer through endangered forests uh, two weekends ago. And we looked at Pera, the, where the, the huge burn was. We looked at uh, the logging of the Cary forests. It was very alarming, such an eye-opener. Um, part of the vision I would like to happen for whenever we fall here is taking tours into those areas to really see them first yes. So that's where we're going now um, to do with stopping logging in our native forest. And certainly the situation with Alcoa is escalating by the day with uh, implications for Bunbury through the port. And um, Vince Pucchio has formed a think tank, I suppose you could call it, uh, to, to look at that. Um, and I've been on board for that and I've found it so informative. Uh, one of the things we are trying to achieve here is to change the State Agreement Act to make our co -op or corporations in general more accountable. Yeah. We had some small wins. Uh, we're hoping to have uh, even a, uh, bigger wins as we go. I'm helping people in Jarrah currently and also involved in changing our colours uh, operating licence. We have uh, put in a, an appeal to stop the 50,000 tonne increase which they have applied for in between all of this. They want to go to 3.3 million tonne. From there they want to go to 4.7 and eventually 6 million tonne. So the idea was to bring as many groups as we can together to help uh, bring about change. Now I'll touch briefly with what we discussed yesterday with Martin Brook, Murdoch University lecturer more than that. We were, it started off with bringing the groups together to change the State Agreement Act, then it became the bringing in the Walling Up group and the uh, Bunbury groups. Martin came up <coughs> with the idea of bringing in the whole state. So that is going to be a major job. What we're looking at is to have a spearhead group with all uh, other groups feeding the spearhead group in order to challenge the government and industry. That's our aim. It's a big ask. But hopefully, if, it, if everyone comes on board, then our chances of succeeding uh, will increase. Now, the way I look at it, this next four years is our best opportunity to change government, and change the policies, and bring about environmental change and climate change. The reason for that is that we only have one party to deal with. That's the Labor Party. They have full control of the houses, and we only have to worry about the, uh, the Labor Party. In the past, that had to be bipartisan agreement, and that was near impossible. So if we miss this window of opportunity, then I, I think we'll be lost. It will take a hell of a lot longer to, to get to go where we want to go. Just brief, briefly in answer to, uh, to some of the things Vince put forward. Um, yeah, the, the Bunbury concept, the vision of uh, coalition alliances between all the different groups was really uh, about building a critical mass. Um, as Vince said, it's a, it's a huge process to realistically think we can influence government and big business to be more ethical, good stewardship, all those things we want to see. To do that, it's very much about this critical mass. Um, many experiments have shown that's only about three to four percent of the community pushing in that direction, and change happens. So that's what we're seeking. How we do that here in Bunbury is up to us. We want to uh, what we want to see come out of this is pathways towards that, but it's getting a life of its own already, and which is very gratifying. And the whole statewide concept, I think, is doable, um, but it's going to take us all and. We're going to have to be careful of our language and how we present it to the wider community. 
um, because with a push like this, we could very easily put people offside. We would have to have a positive message um, about a sustainable WA. And, and I think we need to think big. This is the beginning of thinking big. Um, and there's lots of ideas around that that are sort of, yeah, yeah. Um, Ben's saying that industry will push back. It will uh, flick its tail and, and try and negate what we're doing. That's what happens. That's the, uh, the patriarchal way, isn't it? Uh, John's representing the South West Environment Centre. He's also a very a wonderful activist in the Extinction Rebellion space, and please share some of your journey. So we erected a platform at one of the big tulip trees where they're going to develop. And uh, with different volunteers from the South Environment Centre and some local people too, spent three months living on that platform. So the, according to the uh, law, they couldn't start clearing there with people living in that platform. So they lived on that platform for three months, taking turns. It got a bit windy and cold at times. We had local people supporting us, bringing food, beer, Stuff. Uh, but eventually they came in with um, machinery and uh, started clearing, the the path up to this tree. And Sarah picked, came in and picked the lady who was up there the first time, picked her out of the platform, and they started devastating the area. So about five hectares were cleared within a few days. But then the whole group who'd been organising this shifted down the hill a bit and started another camp. And the government eventually decided or the rock or someone decided it was getting too hard. We didn't want to go through all that trouble again. So that now there's a new regional fire which goes open to Preston. So another wind covered in a different way. So it's always more than one way to skin a cat. Thank you. Thanks, John. Uh, I do have to make mention of John's incredible commitment, and we all probably know a little bit about um, his contribution to the activism space, and uh, he's always to be applauded. Thanks, John. Now, I'm sure you're all aware that faith-based communities are in this space as well, which is just so wonderful. So just a little bit about the ARC. It's a multi-faith-based member organisation of people from around Australia, who are committed to taking action on climate change. So we bring together representatives of all the religions, all the major faith traditions, I should say, are working together to address climate change. So we recognise that climate change is not only a scientific, environmental, economic and political issue, it's also a profoundly moral and spiritual one. Yay. Yes. The Earth's ecosystems are intrinsically precious and beautiful and deserve protection. The well-being of human beings is dependent on ecological flourishing and it's the vulnerable people of the world who are most impacted by climate change. Another organisation that some of us support is called Common Grace. I don't know whether anybody's heard of it, but it's a Christian Indigenous organisation and it's Australia wide and they have a very big arm uh, promoting action on climate change. This is one of the things that they have done recently. Um, these climate change scars from 2019, from 1919, sorry, <laughs> to 2019 just indicate the amount of the, the temperature change in the world. And these are being presented to politicians in a couple of weeks' time with by Common Grace. So they also have a fantastic web page and resources that they can help with. So uh, I'd like to invite uh, Jeff Bremer to the mic. Um, Jeff is a very hard worker for the preservation of the Northern Jarrah forests. He's recently submitted um, a submission to the EPA, which I read a few days ago, and it was an eye-opener for me. 
um, just how government bodies operate in that space, how they're under-resourced, under-manned. And it, it was a very important document, and I hope that Jeff is going to tell us a bit about that. Yes, my name's Jeff Bremer. I'm a member of WAFA, the Wilderness Society, Jaredale Forest Protectors, Dwelling Up Discovery Forest Defenders. I'm very much, uh, at this stage, feeling pretty much like a lone operator. Um, and when Gordon mentioned that we could uh, actually try and draw together groups and pool our resources, our cooperation and communicate, that is probably the most important thing. As you know, Alcoa has uh, put in an uh, application to open up another 40,000 hectares of Jarrah uh, forest. Um, out of that, there will be, um, they say, 6,700 hectares cleared, but it's more like about 9,000. Um, and uh, that, process is going through at a very fast rate. Uh, they just recently released the environmental scoping document, which is, if you like, the table of contents for the environmental review. And if you've seen those reviews, they can be a thousand pages. Um, but no, it'll be submitted on, I think, the 10th of December, and the public will be given eight weeks to comment. Now, fortunately, in 2020, uh, the government legislated to make changes to the Environmental Protection Act and those changes in come down to two words, cumulative impact. For the first time, um, uh, more to the point, mining companies have always been opening up new areas but we, um, applying for an environmental review for the incremental little bit that they did. And for the first time, they actually have to now account for the cumulative impact of not only the little bit they did, but everything they've done up to date, which includes air emissions, things, which, uh, you know. Now, um, so these are very big changes, but the ability of the EPA or the department to um, keep, uh, even assess the cumulative impact themselves is um, not there. They've suffered very large budget cuts over the last two decades, maybe three decades. The science that's put forward by, in this case, Alcoa, uh, is actually published in refereed journals where they will claim something like that they've got 100% species richness, when in fact they've cleared the forest, put in the plantation. No one has ever seen 100% species richness. But the main point is that that goes to a referee journal where the referees um, are not revealed, their processes are not revealed, the um, criteria of um, are judge of, of review, and then finally the data itself is not revealed. And so there's conflicts of interest all over the place, but that has actually got Alcoa to have a worldwide reputation as the leading company for ecological restoration. Now, I don't have a, a display here, but uh, basically you'd be lucky to get one species in the under understory um, on these plantations. Point in the picture I made in the submission is that we've actually got an environmental system of legislation Australia-wide, if not worldwide, that does not protect the environment. And I don't think anyone here needs a lot of persuading about that. There's a report that came out in um, October last year called the Samuel Report, which is a review of the EPPC Act, the Federal Act, to protect the environment. And it's a damning indictment on the federal government um, and, and on the Act. And basically, the main message of that reform was that, uh, first of all, that lack of budget and lack of personnel was no excuse for not actually enforcing the Act. And that secondly, Australians had given up faith in the government and their ability to protect the environment. And so, just as Alcoa can pretty much write the rules as, as they like it, they, 
like quite outrageous claims, but you know the um, the uh, EPA Act requires an independent review. But those particular reviewers, when they get subject matter reviewers, there's no declared um, conflict of interest. And Samuel did say that when legislation and governance on on the environment fails, then they actually tends to be a large number of third party actions that will start to try and protect the environment. And this meeting was just one of them. But what I am talking about is people chaining themselves to bulldozers, climbing up trees, and taking court cases. <coughs> and here's a few examples. Um, um, I guess, first of all, there's the Duke and Gorge which everyone understands is just a massive failure in environmental governance. The next is that in uh, early May this year, uh, DBCA, the Department of Biodiversity, Conservation and Attractions, are responsible for all endangered wildlife in this state, started a, a hazard reduction burn in the Perup Forest uh, over 1,900 hectares. They put a ring fire around the 1,900 hectares and for a day dropped incendiaries from an helicopter at 150 metre space in the Red Network. The inferno could be seen, you know, for, in Albany. Uh, it uh, basically burnt right to the top of the canopy right down to the ground. The only thing that survived was termites and ants. And that particular bit of forest was the second last refuge on Earth for about 80 numbats, and they killed them all. Now, had you or I gone and perhaps kicked the numbats' nest, disturbed them, or, you know, God forbid we might have killed one, we'd be up for a half million dollar fine. Now, the DBCA um, uh, uh, enforces that act, and there's arguments saying that they have authorised authority to do a hazard reduction burn, and whoops, we killed them all, that's a perfectly okay excuse. Um, I'm still following this up, but as far as I'm concerned, all the persons there should be charged under the DBCA, and I think there is enough leeway in that act to actually uh, uh, set a court case. But how do you do that just as a single individual? Or single, you know, we do need to work and cooperate. In summary then, what I'm saying here is whatever we're doing and however you're protecting the environment, we're actually dealing with a very broken system and our big picture has got to be not to save just that little bit of road or, you know, that that um, uh, coop or forest or, or what have you, they're very important actions and everything that everyone is doing here is, is laudable and important. But somehow we've got to connect and become a much bigger movement to actually make change and the only way to make those changes is to actually make politicians feel that, that there is a movement for change that they can't resist and I really do think that the only way we can do that is we have to be strategic and coordinated and start pushing like hell. Um, yeah. One last thing, Diane Evers, who I think most of you would know and you know greatly admire, um, let's slip in one of Vince's meetings that until you have 150,000 people marching in Perth, you're not actually going to change yeah. any views in those governments. In most cases, the legislation's not that bad, but they are probably working, and in fact, in the Samuels review, it wasn't actually a review, but there's been a review, uh, the EPBC uh, department, if you like, in the federal government, has something like 10 to 15 percent of the um, uh, budget that they need to protect and save critically endangered species. Um, I was shocked to find that there's actually been five mammal extinctions in the first five months of 2021. That's unheard of, and it's an indication of just how sick and 
desperate for more than in the environment. So anyway, as I said, we really do have to cooperate, get strategic as a coordinated bunch of people, and then fight like hell to get this into the public debate so that it gets bigger and bigger. But anyway, thank you very much. Activism has many faces, so um, different uh, different extremes. And I'd like to. Um, I am involved with Extinction Rebellion, and there are people here today who um, done the, the whole thing of lying down in the middle of the Perth streets and being arrested. Um, and so I have great admiration for their willing to commit to those actions. Not that everyone has to do that. Um, there are so many avenues of activism. And that's what what we're about today is looking at those avenues, moving forward. We're all just trying to see pathways forward with this vision. So the focus of XR is by definition not a single issue, or even a particular set of issues. It is the global emergency situation, the climate and ecological crisis that we are all facing. And I think a number of speakers have identified that, Jeff particularly powerfully. Um, and that's because of the combination of all the relevant and particular issues that may have brought us into this room today. Um, XR is uh, active on many fronts, multiple, on multiple issues. There is, there is or has been focus on Alcoa, or Sipco, or Woodside, Rio Tinto, the banks, the Dudley River. It's all being it's all part of what we're looking at, what we're talking about, and the actions that we're taking or planning to take. In conservative and comfortable communities, regional centres like Bunbury, our strategies of civil disobedience and disruption, albeit non-violent disruption, um, are confronting for the general population. And for us, I guess, in reality, that means we tend to have small meetings and big mailing lists. Uh, there is good support out there. Um, and we saw it. it we, we were out on the highway with our banners over the long weekend on the Friday and the Monday. And a number of encouraging waves and toots and call, calls we got was really uh, positive and encouraging. Um, those numbers are growing, but it is making that next step, getting those people who will wave from the comfort of their car and give you a thumbs up, getting them to make that next step to activism, um, disruptive activism, disruptive activism at that, that is the challenge. But we know that when you can do that, when you can get the numbers to do those disruptive activa activations safely, that it is particularly powerful. All of the, as you probably already guessed, all of the current active members of Extension Rebellion from Rump Hungary are members of other environmentally focused groups. And several have spoken or are speaking here today on behalf of those other groups. So we are interconnected. I think that really demonstrates our willingness at the same time to ally with and work with other groups. And currently XR is working at state and national level on conversations that are probably similar to the ones that, the one that has brought us into this room. So you know, there's a lot going on. I think I can say that we are broadly pretty keen to uh, participate in non-branded actions across the various areas of environmental concern. Um, when we might bring together our combined numbers to really make people sit up and notice. Um, to show that critical mass that Gordon so significantly mentioned. And to show that even though we may be different in some dimensions, we are together. We are part of the same endeavour. Finally, I just want to draw your attention to one of the key demands of Extinction Rebellion, which is under the header of Beyond Politics, and we are more political. And it goes on to say, government must create and be led by the decisions of a citizen's assembly on climate and ecological justice. And as I see it, I know it is a number of people see it, 
This is the essence of why we are meeting here today. It is a community voice, a voice from a community that is not corrupted and compromised by the vested interests that have captured our current governments and been able to capture the various avenues of communication that others have spoken about very powerfully here today. So, yep, we're in, we're up for it. Let's take it forward. Thank you very much. My name is Kate Fennick and I'm part of Bunbury's SS4C group. My mum is also a part of XR, so as you can see, uh, climate change is a bit of a family affair. Um, it is spoken about at the dinner table and it is also yelled at the TV at times. <laughs> <laughs> Today is an exciting day for our Southwest community. Climate action groups gathering to co coordinate in the face of ever-growing threat posed by climate change. There has been much notable progress across our country of late. Possibly the most outstanding has been the High Court action Sharma on behalf of school kids versus the Federal Environmental Minister Susan Lane. Both Bella and I are part of this action. Bella was one of eight school stri strikers that made a submission. The purpose of this action was to stop the approval of yet another pollution producing coal mine and to hold the minister accountable. The judges recognise that the Minister has a duty to take responsible care not to cause us injury resulting from climate change. The court did not order an injunction stopping the mine, but it is not over yet. There will be further submissions on what duty of care means for the Minister's decision and the mine. This is a huge game changer in the way we are responding to climate change. Our work is paying off, but this does not mean we should lay off now. We still have much work to do. This group is a step forward in the right direction, and SS4C is excited to be a part of this collaboration. The SS4C network is organising around the country to create change for a sustainable future free of fossil fuels through a just transition. A great concern to us right now is the gas lead recovery. According to global data, there are 118 oil and gas projects planned in Australia between 2021 and 2025. This is inconsistent with the goal of reduced emissions. WA is on track to become a global gas hub. Of immediate concern and on our doorstep is Woodside Scarborough Offshore Gas Project, which is about to be approved. This project will produce more emissions than a Adani, 1.6 billion tonnes in its lifetime. The WA government's slogan, Building Our Future, is greenwash. It is actually stealing our future. We are eagerly awaiting the outcome of the G7 meeting in Cornwall in the hope that international pressure will change this. Our most recent Fund Our Future Not Gas strikes have been very well attended across the country. The major action has been in the capital cities. Bunbury strikes have been successful too. SS4C is all about my generation and how we are terrified about our future. We strike from school. This is not a benefit for us. This is us sacrificing our learning hours to send a message to the government that we are serious and worried about our rapidly worsening future. All are welcome to join us. Overall, this collective of like-minded people with a common goal will, we hope, be inspiring to the Bunbury community and the greater Southwest in many ways. A larger group of climate activists will help to build support, raise the alarm and further recruit to help our cause as well as send a strong message to the government. We appreciate all the work being done by each of the groups attending today and look forward to working with this collective towards creating a better future for us all. I'm very grateful to have you here Katie, thank you so much. Um, creative activism. I've been learning about uh, what that is and how much fun it is. You know? um, XR did an action down at Kubana not so long ago where we made up these mannequins and we put all our heads in the sand, which was symbolic of you know, the government's got their head in the sands. And it was such a fun process. We had a great time. And you know, people see those images and it doesn't always make sense to them initially, but presence consistent presence. I think that's 
Our collaborative uh, network is about creating consistent presence that is sustainable over a long period. I'm a minister within the United Church and I work with the social justice arm of a number of the churches, but also with the Australian Religious Response to Climate Change and with Common Grace, and I've also needed a couple of those scars. Uh, our, our advocacy is to government, I suppose, mainly to try and give another voice from the churches and faith bodies that this is important. But I think one of the key things that we can do is try to communicate and educate what are sometimes conservative elements of our communities. So we'll be aware that a number of people in churches are fairly conservative. Um, so it's trying to get them to see that their central aspects of their faith and belief and values actually tie in with the nurture of the environment. For me, also, it is about political voice and a political change. I'm also a member of the Greens. Uh, not the only party that is trying to do things, but perhaps one which is trying to do things more prominently. And so, while politics is a, is a dirty game, um, unless we can also change some of the political system and have a political voice, <coughs> other things won't happen. So. Um, my name's Joanne, I'm from a group called Friends of the Dolores Bible, and in one form or another, it's actually been around since 1995. A couple of years ago, we reformed, we became um, an association, we formed a committee, and we became a bit more structured. Why are we here? Because the southern alignment of the Bunbury Outer Ring Road goes straight through the middle of Dolores. It cuts out people's homes, and there's a lot of other issues around it. From, from an environmental point of view, it does some pretty significant damage to uh, critically endangered chill woodlands and to endangered Banksia woodlands. Um, within the heavily wooded Banksia woodlands, there's a really healthy populations of western ringtail possums, fastigales, there's also the three different endangered species of black cockatoos, um, and that's all going to become road. So we are fighting to get the route changed because we believe that there is a, another route that has less environmental impact. There are also social and economic reasons why it shouldn't go through the middle of Dora, but um, I'm going to focus on the, um, the environmental side of it, which is actually, depending on who you talk to within the group, the most significant one. But basically our group has focused on looking at the information and all the reports that have gone out there, and going, that's not right, that's not right, that's not complete. So we found when we formed very early on that direct, direct action is really hard. It's really tough to get people to, um, to protest. Really, really difficult. However, one thing we have tried to do is contact and make form relationships with other like-minded groups because I think this is the way we do it. Not little groups. We are a single issue group but we have formed relationships with other groups in the same boat for all kinds of reasons. Um, so I think the value of forming a group is that we help each other. Uh, one thing that with a small issue group, there's been a fair bit of opposition to our group personally. So because there's not really a good reason to keep the route where it is, it does in fact go through the middle of a community and takes out 33 people's homes. They've actually called us NIMBYs, they've called us uneducated, they've called a whole bunch of names in the papers, you know, on, on Facebook, all that kind of thing. And we need to look after each other from a mental health point of view. One of the best things that happened is that Eddie Wayon came on board, got into the newspaper and went, this group's right. We've done a tree, we did a tree survey with him. And so getting people together where, that, that support each other, that say, no, what you're doing is right. This is important, we are fighting for the future. And it kind of reduces the noise of everybody else who's telling us the opposite. Um, and also within small groups, there's a very high risk of burnout. So I think that um, in helping each other, we look after it. We look after ourselves and each other at the same time. And the other thing I think that's really important is that we share information about environmental processes, about scientific research. So, 
Um, our group has a lot of opinionated, strong, bullshit people, and um, keeping them together, one of the things we do is we accept each other's differences, our strengths, our weaknesses, but more importantly, we, bring out, we embrace our commonality to work together. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. These are snapshots of all different people, uh, groups of what people are doing are very invaluable, I think, in, in getting an overview and seeing how an umbrella organisation can move their focus from one to the other to time actions uh, appropriate to what seems to be the focus across many different fronts. So I think we're achieving that. Out of all of this, we hopefully will come together on the, the next meeting and form clear pathways. It's a great honour to be here and I'd like to acknowledge Katie um, who has um, with Bella and the other students of this region and other students in Australia brought about a, um, a, a really remarkable step forward in the law in Australia in recognising that there is a duty of care owed by government to the next generation to look after our environment. So Green Teach Southwest Inc. is a very small group and we are, our objectives are to improve environmental education and act as a catalyst to improve our environment. So we're about inspiring passion uh, in students. Um, we, we try and make the education hands-on and to help them to learn to know and love their local ecology. And we're now focusing on um, global issues also um, because we can see the need to um, uh, bring student awareness to uh, some of the things that are absolutely critical and to try to simplify them so that students can pick them up, understand them, run with them, talk to their parents about them and maybe influence them. And we are looking at more um, uh, older age students and adults in that, uh, that objective and um, we, uh, we are reminding these students that um, the pandemic that we're in now is actually caused, um, uh, aside from the, the business of um, the virology clinic in Wuhan, which may be uh, important, from 1975 there have been a succession of uh, pandemics including SARS uh, and HIV and they are, according to the research, uh, caused by um, environmental issues in factory farming um, and in loss of habitat in bringing animals closer to humans. The summer ice in the Arctic is we've lost 40% and um, if you've seen this book by uh, Dr. Carl, The Little Book of Climate Change Science, um, uh, you'd know that uh, we, mankind, have actually managed to move the Earth on its axis, very slightly, but because the summer ice has been moving uh, into water and then to the equatorial regions, we've actually changed the axis of the Earth. Um, and the equatorial rainforest, we've lost 50% which is absolutely crucial at equatorial rainforest to the production of moisture and oxygen. And we have lost, we, we are facing the extinction of one min, million species out of eight, and we have only 35% of our wildlife left. Um, we like to try to encapsulate what needs to be done and then help students to see how they can make an impact at the local level and it can be encapsulated, we think, in three things. Stop burning fossil fuels, two. Rewild and clean up our oceans of plastic. But the rewilding just requires one-third fish sanctuaries, especially in coastal regions, but throughout the oceans. And rewild our land, which is... Uh, and it's just wonderful to hear you all speaking about preserving what we have in the way of native forest. It's reserving unproductive land to make it um, to allow nature to return that native forest, to regenerate native forest and to um, regenerate uh, our agriculture. And in that uh, last respect, we have some people who are in Green Teach, very respectful, 
of farmers and all they've done and are trying to do, so it's a controversial subject, but um, I'm pretty committed to it because all the literature I read is that um, the carbon goes back into the soil when we, um, we regenerate our agriculture and bring back uh, native wildlife and get native forestry going on our farms. And what we're looking for is 12 worms to every shovelful. <laughs> a beautiful, what we need, I think, is a vision of a beautiful and fulfilling life in the context of worldwide healthy biodiversity. And we need to be led in this in some measure by indigenous people. We need to end unbridled capitalism with economic process, uh, progress. We need to end unbridled capitalism with economic progress whilst chewing up nature. We can maintain free enterprise with nature, in harmony with nature. As nature can be conserved, restored and used sustainably while simultaneously meeting other global societal goals through urgent and concerted efforts fostering transformative change. But we do have to have transformative change and it has to take place right now. And we are talking now about uh, the potential. Some scientists are saying we're not sure whether we haven't gone past tipping points. But we're coming to tipping points and we're coming to cascading problems that will be irreversible. Um, and the next page of this um, uh, global assessment report on biodiversity and eco ecosystem uh, services just sets out in summary the kind of things that need to be done um, to, to bring about this transformative change, including incentives and capacity building. So for every environmentally responsible action, there needs to be incentives for that and disincentives for the reverse. The challenge uh, just locally that Green Teach happens to be interested in is the Banksia Road tip, which takes hundreds of thousands of tonnes per annum of putrescibles and also a radioactive waste, radioactive waste. It's over a, a fault line, it's in a fault area, which means that there is going to be activity there and the liners that contain all this stuff will be broken. It's just a question of when and over it. Um, we, and it is placed over three aquifers, one which it provides the water for the town of Dar Darna, then over the Leederville aquifer and the Yarragadee aquifer, um, which, uh, uh, which may be polluted. Uh, all three of them, um, certainly the top aquifer will go, uh, in due course, unless this has changed. And um, I share the concerns of uh, the, those other speakers who mentioned the Northwest, Northwest Shelf Gas. Um, there is um, uh, enough evidence to establish that many of the uh, gas uh, um, organisations in that area are producing a huge amount of gas, which is a gigantic um, ecological footprint um, which is over the amounts that they agreed that they would limit and the government has been silent on it. Um, I agree that we need some radical changes to our laws. They're not working for our environment. We need consultation and hopefully, um, maybe through a group like this, we can come to consult um, in, in a collegiate way with ministers here in Western Australia together in education, agriculture, environment, climate change, health, water, forestry, fisheries, and the Premier himself to see if we can't um, help them to understand where we're at now and um, where we need to get to if we are going to look after um, the health of the, um, the generations that are living now and the existence of generations thereafter. And finally, I would like to suggest that there should be um, environmental education. We've failed completely uh, in the education systems throughout Australia. We need environmental education at every level and in every discipline. Um, we have a few minutes left, just to give you a quick snapshot into actions that uh, are already firming up. 
Um, the main one being a two-day conference statewide. One in Bunbury, we have a venue targeted. One in Perth, um, in, at Murdoch University, we have venues in place. And hopefully it will extend into the north. So we're looking at February, two-day conferences statewide. Um, with various leading events, um, the Cry of the Forest in Bunbury, probably around September. September is Sustainability Month. We want lots of actions. Uh, I will try and keep everyone informed. If you can feed me your actions, I will communicate out to everyone here and hopefully you can share it further. So we have one more speaker and um, Marilyn Palmer well, what can I say about Marilyn? She, she has, she's across so much um, environmentally, um, social justice issues, and I think she's a very fitting person to, to wind us up. I did want to take the opportunity just to touch base with Vince. Hi, I had a bit to do with the R Luke in the CAPS group. Um, and first, a couple of people asked me about Martin Brookner, who um, Vince talked about, and that Martin's an academic at um, Murdoch, who I've worked with as well around eco justice and leadership. Um, one of the things that Martin does, which I just want to share with you, because I've just been listening to this and thinking that his framework is really useful, he talks about three kinds of licences that people need to start up the planet, basically, um, and that we need to be aware of so that we can counteract those, and that's the social licence that we're all familiar with, the legal licence and the political licence. So I think in terms of going forward, it's helpful to, for all of us, to be kind of mindful about where we're putting our energies and to just except that any, anything we do is valuable. So most recently I've been involved with the Women's March for Justice and watching that group really seriously think about how to dismantle patriarchy, um, revolutionise the world from a decolonising perspective because if we don't address the core hurt in Australia, which is colonisation, then we just keep repeating over and over and again what we believe is a legitimate license to rape the planet, and, and that's not okay. Everyone is writing about the fact that we are on really, really fragile ground now. So people like Jim Bendel, um, building on the work that was done in the 1970s by the Meadows, who wrote the original Minutes to Growth work that said, uh, it's not rocket science, you can't have infinite growth on a finite planet. So this is where we're at, and we really are going to be on the right side of history if we can just keep activating ourselves and linking and connecting. What Women's March for Justice has been doing, which I really love, is we hold a vigil outside Noel Marino's office every Friday morning between 8 and 9, with a whole lot of just very creative signs that try and make the point, basically that she's doing nothing as our federal member, but also alerting passers-by just to what the issues are. And I think this has been an incredible piece of activism, partly because, like Gordon said, you actually need to stay motivated. And it just brings people together in solidarity. And that's what this is. It's lovely to be here and to see everybody because this is really the, what we have to do is to be solid and hold together and believe that we are in the majority. And Australia Talks, the ABC program, is really affirming that people generally are concerned and want a compassionate, sustainable, peaceful world. But we are going to have to work for it because the forces that are wanting to hold us back, both in terms of white supremacy, patriarchy and rampant growth-based capitalism are alive and well and they've got their strategies down pat so we need to be super alert and connected to, to deal with that. So, so a big, big thank you to everyone who's spoken, for everyone who's here. Remember, this is, this is your space. Um, I feel my role is just to help create this platform where we can all have input, where we're all listened to, where we feel a sense of inclusiveness and a willingness to support each other as our various actions have their time sequence. Um, some of us can drop in behind that and support all our, all our objectives. And certainly feedback about today, how you feel we could improve the process and what are your ideas around pathways forward. Thank you so much.